All right, this here we are. <laughs> welcome to Throws Talk. Going to take this opportunity to, to to speak to some of the greats of the sport, and you certainly are one of the greats of the sport. Well, thank you for saying that, Coach. Uh, all right, we're here at the the wonderful U.S. Olympic Training Center, and you're a, a valuable part of that now. Um, you've been here the last couple of years, consulting and stuff. Tell us about what the training center is and what it what it's meant to be for USA Track and Field, but also USA Throwing specifically. Well, it was originally uh, uh, set up for the warm weather sports because we already had Colorado Springs and Lake Placid and uh, it's done its job admirably here because the weather is so perfect um, 186 acres were developed and uh, uh, USOC has invested uh, quite a bit of money in, in this facility and USA Track and Field is running the athletics portion of the training but with the financial support of USOC. And so we have athletes that are both on campus, living uh, on the dormitories here, training with us full time, and some that live off campus, but use this as their primary training base. And we have a, a staff of several coaches, primarily field events uh, and multis, and uh, we're trying to fulfill a need in that area here in the United States, post-collegiately. There's been a lot of talent that's come here over the years um, you know, and, and based themselves here, particularly in the throws and jumps. You've had uh, good success in the jumps, less so in the throws in terms of the world scene. And, and I think that's one of the reasons you were brought in to consult on that. Well, the original concept was you kind of were handed this reward for being a A-level athlete or a top-level athlete, and there were Basically, it wasn't a developmental or a training mandatory environment. It was, you've earned it. If you need a place to stay, do what you want. Eat all this wonderful food and enjoy the good weather. So the majority of the athletes were not on a structured day-to-day -day program. A few coaches did get started with that, but it would kind of um, get going and then die out a little bit. But well, we did have um, some coaches who came in and developed uh, a developmental program, which for a while was doing great things in the discus. Um, but there's never been what we would call a uh, long-term day-to-day program to develop yeah. elite athletes. Yeah. And, and you've had, uh, you said there have been some great discus throws here now. The U.S. in the last few years has been really known for producing an incredible stream of shot putters, the one after the other. Um, but the discus has, has probably been since the great days that we remember of, of Mac Wilkins, who's here as one of the coaches, and John Powell. Um, the U.S. hasn't been as strong internationally since then. What, what do you think part of that is? Well, there's a lot of different things that go into, into play. One is we're not in a vacuum. Uh, when you get opponents that are older, uh, well coached and that we're part of a strong system of talent uh, identification, it's going to be tougher to beat those guys than it would have been, let's say, back in the day, Adolfo Consolini, who was a very tough performer, Ludwig Donick. These guys, it's more structured now how we're getting to champions because every federation has very few areas where they can medal. So they try and uh, pursue high-level development in those areas. So you're having the German and Polish teams, Belarusians, developing a school of throwers that is very, very tough to uh, combat if you yourself don't have a school of throwers. And I would say we really haven't had a school of throwers. The other thing is the shot put is a younger guy's game. So the college kids graduate college nearly at international levels. In fact, a lot of foreign coaches and athletes read the results from the NCAA and go, we could be in trouble soon. You don't see that from the discus because it's an older man's game. And you may get a lucky early throw by a younger thrower, but the finesse required to do reproducible results inside a stadium, we are drifting further and further away from that level athlete if we don't bridge them with a place like uh, this training center bridge them and put them in a structured environment for four or five years until their mid to late 20s where they can start visualizing 68 meter throws in the stadium uh, at any given time. 
And, and you yourself, you're here, you've got a great, great tradition uh, working in the coach, you're a long, long time coach at UCLA. Um, you've got a little group of athletes here that are doing pretty well. One in particular, Joe Kovacs, who's yes. now your third 22 meter thrower, if I'm, if I'm right. Yes. John Brenner and John Kadena being the others, and yes. now Joe Kovacs. Tell us a little bit about those three guys particularly and what made them special and, and what you see uh, about Joe in the future. You see some of the same qualities with people that uh, I think what's interesting is those three are very gifted, but I've had athletes that have come across my path with what appear to be similar gifts. It's the ability to synthesize so many parts of their live of their being like uh, some people uh, are just weight room oriented others are very easily swayed by oh outside activities that not to do with sport and so you just go well that was a very gifted athlete but it wasn't meant to be and when you see someone who knows how to be boring I think Brenner is the first one that said a great athlete needs to learn how to be a little boring just stick to the tasks, uh, do what needs to be done. And uh, Joe's one of those. He just walked in the first day and said, I don't care if I ever see a video of myself, just tell me what I need to do. I want to feel it, I want to learn it. And I knew right there I had a very special athlete. I also knew that he was very inconsistent and what, what would be even by American standards a very wild thrower. So I said, here's a great example of an athlete that I'm going to pick up and see, I was able to get 18 year olds to become very, very consistent and very uh, uh, conscious of the details of the throw. What about a guy that's thrown fairly well already, but it's really wild, will he settle down and be able to be disciplined and put aside these marks that he's already achieved until he makes the transition? So. Three years ago was a real tough year for him emotionally because he was throwing less than he did as a collegiate. And then last year he started seeing the results culminating with the 22 meter throw to win USA's, which I thought the win was more important than 22 meters. Because I'm, I'm a big believer in medals and performance when it counts and not just, you know, little tiny all comers meet and there's a world leading mark. So they're always, everything we do is based on being ready for the big competitions where everybody has their motivation to do well. So that was really important. And the other important thing for me last year was that Joe would learn to go from an indoor season, which he got a lifetime best, all the way to a 21 mid meter throw at the end of the season at uh, Diamond League uh, final. And uh, he did that. And so I realized that the stepping stones were being taken care of at that point. And so far, everything's going well. We skipped indoor because we did have some ambitious plans for this year. Um, what are you thinking? What are you changing for this year with Joe? The big change was I needed a little more time on the, on the fine tuning of the mechanics. And I knew that an indoor season would interfere with that. And I also wanted him to learn, I used to give him the, the story that John Brenner in his 1987 season opened up with a lifetime best and an American record. I mentioned the big throw that Timmerman had. I mentioned so many throwers who have been able to train all year, not have any meets, open up and hit a big throw. So that was one of our goals, that, that let's make sure we have that ability. Because that ability will come very handy, especially with an American. If I don't want him traveling all over the world and I want him settled in here, and you say, well, he hasn't thrown in five weeks, what will he do at the Olympics or the Worlds? I want him to know it's possible to throw really far with not only no meets in four or five weeks, but maybe not in seven months. And that was the intent of and getting that season going. And he did open up this year with a tremendous throw. Open up throw. with a 22-35, and I also don't expect him to just keep building off that because we are back in training again. The idea was to teach him something there. The lessons continue. Now, lesson number one he's got to learn that it doesn't matter how you rank in the world if you're not on that U.S. team. And it's a meritocracy on that U.S. team. He has to earn it. He cannot be chosen unless in the future for another world he gets the IAAF exceptions. 
So he doesn't have an exemption right now. He, he needs to earn it. So he could have a 2350 throw, and it wouldn't matter if he gets sixth at the USA's. So number one on our book is making the team. Number two is prior to making the team, before the season even started, having our plan in place if you do make the team, because that's the reason that people become great, is to do well on the world stage. And that's what the plan is. Again, make the team, prepare for Beijing. And also talking to him after that meet, and it was a great throw, but he was also very much motivated by the fact that it was at UCLA's, your old stomping ground, yes. and he didn't want to embarrass you. <laughs> yes, he wanted to do well at, at, at my old school, 30 years there, uh, wonderful experience. You visited me multiple times, and you know what a, what a special place. And uh, we not only saw the great kids that were developing there, but so many visitors that would come by as youngsters who became world class. So it really is an exciting thing. And having one of my ex throwers there as a coach and John Frazier, all these things are magical for me. But the most important thing was let's get to business. Uh, you're ready, you're capable. We had seen training throws already that indicated that he could throw this type of distance. Uh, anywhere between 2180 and probably 2250. So that's where we keep working. And one of the things that I think makes him so unique is um, he's the strongest physical specimen I've dealt with uh, who still has throwing movements. Um, much, much stronger than a, than a John Godin or a John Brenner at that stage. And with lots of upside for the strength. So I'm, the strength is being developed in a very cautious and patient manner because he should be, if we're smart, a long-term thrower for this country. Just like Hoff and Godina have been and were, and, uh, and I think that's, that's one of the keys we should be shooting for in the U.S., identify the talent and keep it for a long time. There was a lot of discussion when we were up at UCLA that uh, the 2235 was a, was an area record in that little corner of the track that's now the throwing circle, yes, but not the stadium record. Not the record. stadium record. Stadium record is the world record, but that was set in the middle of the field, which is long gone, that ring. And so it's an area record of about uh, uh, 50 square meters or something. So I told him, that's all you own. You own that small area. But there's been some great throws that have been great through there. Great throws and, and also uh, uh, just uh, being a Rayford Johnson, Jackie Joyner, Kersey meet, that was exciting too. That uh, Old friends of mine and so it was exciting. They went up and met Rayford. Rayford gave him a rundown of the 60 Olympic final. Okay. Those type of things are exciting. I, I like to cross-pollinate the athletes yeah. with other areas, other disciplines, other eras. That's very important. I am a definite student of the event. Yeah. And uh, that's why I enjoy talking yeah. to you because you bring in so many exciting yeah. new yeah. ideas. So. And because of my studies, also, so I relate them to old ideas yeah. Yeah. too. And so that's exciting yeah. for yeah. me. You also have a, a great uh, group atmosphere. You had in UCLA, there was a great tradition of the team, usually around one superstar, around Kadena or around a Brenner, and the others played their supporting role and yes. all worked hard. I remember going to meets with them as well. And you kind of have that now here again with, with Joe and uh, the group of athletes you're working the with The difference here. here is though that there's several athletes that have the potential to out-medal Joe potentially. So I'm not necessarily downplaying that it just happens where he's broken through sooner but the group of athletes we have and we hope to keep adding uh, would uh, give us a great opportunity in the throws in the future uh, it's it's ridiculous to think that I can pull it off myself so I'm hoping it's it's with the help of uh, Mac Wilkins with the help of the, the staff here the weight room staff and possibly some other centers of excellence I know for a fact I have several athletes, one of them being, of course, Tom Babbitt, who's one of the greatest throw coaches in the world and has had uh, Reese Hoffa and, and, uh, and uh, Adam Nelson and Pearl Greer and so many others. Uh, we want to, I think, establish the concept of centers of excellence and, and realize that uh, it is a labor of love. You're not, I don't care how much the shoe companies come up with it's not enough to put your life on hold unless you love what you're doing. So we're trying to emphasize to the athletes what a great journey this is. And I noticed in your case, you extended it as a coach and as a uh, 
person that evaluates the whole world scene in terms of techniques and momentum and so on, you realize that passion is what drives this whole thing. But you have to have minimum standards of support. And I'm after at least that. If you don't have that, then you then just forget about it. It's not going to work. So you have to have a minimum standard, which I think uh, we definitely have that and then a little more here. And, and when we talk about yourself, and there's an there's a incredible legacy that you're leaving, not least because the athletes with the Brenners, the Godina, and now Joe, three 22-meter throwers, and many, many others beside. But I think also people are maybe not aware of the coaching legacy that you're leaving. That's my primary goal. My primary goal is to keep developing coaches because <clears throat> I believe that uh, throwing is the ultimate decathlon. And, <coughs> and, uh, we as throw coaches are the, are the excuse me, I get a little drink here just a second. <coughs> we as throw coaches have to have a strong understanding more than just about any other area of gymnastics, Olympic lifting, power lifting, bodybuilding. It reminds me back to the old days of physical culture rather than any one area. And the running program, the hurdle mobility, I use experts to help me with that, but I need to get involved myself and put together, synthesize these programs for them. And I feel that the uh, future of the sport is very much dependent on people having this, this very high level awareness of these different disciplines so that throwing can get its fair due. And if you want people to last healthy into their mid to late 30s and they're genetically very gifted, elastic, and explosive, any errors in those training methodologies can cost you early retirements. So I've been trying to, I'm known kind of as an old school guy and stuff, but at the same time, I look very carefully at what people are doing. And I'm, I'm amazed at what I see Dr. Bunderchuk when he visits, the Polish team when they visit, uh, the German teams when they visit. I'm looking, you know, what they do all have in common is educated people making educated choices. And that's what we really want to keep pushing. And to me, it's a form of creating high level education that athletes don't have to be getting on an airplane and having to go to another country to get help. Hopefully there'll be several people geographically here in the States. And obviously not just, this is just what I'm trying to do for myself and the group of people I've put into coaching. But we have many different schools of thought that are very successful, right. who are doing great things. I know Bunder, Bunderchuk has some wonderful coaches now that are developed through his program in the US, Greg Watson. And, uh, you have people that come from uh, the Louis Simmons powerlifting phase and, and, and people that uh, followed, uh, uh, you know, what was, was more traditional at the time, but they got very sophisticated with it. And, and you have to look at the results. They're, they're there. I mean, there's some great performances by John Smith and his crew. So these are not groups that have anything in particular to do with me, but I admire what they're doing. And I think as long as they put out coaches themselves, we're going to be in great shape. It's always good to have some disagreements and a little bit of, you know, looking over each other's shoulders. So that's good for the sport to not have a one system for everybody. And within my athletes, they do follow tremendous creativity away from what I do. Right. You, you spoke there about the coaches that you admire. I've always been very interested. Who are the athletes that you've seen? Because you've seen so many different athletes. And I'm not thinking really about the ones that you've coached so much as those others around the world. Who are the guys that got you excited that you've seen over the years? Well, as a youngster, you know, we're just coming up. Uh, the magic, to me it was magic. That's what got me started into the sport. Randy Matson. Uh Looked like a big basketball player. And... Uh, you know, I, I remember picking up an eight pound shot and a 10 pound shot, and here's this guy pushing at 70, and it's just, okay, uh, who needs to go see Siegfried and Roy or, or Chris Angel? This is magic right there. Uh, that was unique. And uh, the fact of the matter, uh, obviously, I, I was at the world record uh, when uh, uh, Woods threw the world record indoors in LA. Uh, 
Uh, you know, I watched Randy Barnes throw his world record uh, and so on. And so I admire that, obviously, but my admiration has come more uh, watching the kids that don't make it, who just can't quit. They just persist and persist. And I've had a few that I've watched that, you know, throw and I go, that's just amazing. Um, disciplined athletes. I mean, I, you think it's kind of weird coming from a shot guy, but uh, Backley is one of them. Selesny's another. Backley because he did all the basic things so well. Selesny because he took something beyond belief, something that is so far. There's the outliers, and there's an outlier beyond the outliers. That's Selesny. And uh, really impressive to, to the point where I would walk around with my video camera videotaping him doing mundane things at the track. And I know he felt really odd that why is this guy following me around? Because I would even videotape him getting worked on and stretching. I was just in, intrigued by somebody like that. Um, obviously, it's a shame that I, um, that I never uh, spent time with, uh, except briefly socially at the end with Al Order. But there's just some great athletes like that. I think that, that one of the things that impressed me dramatically, uh, it changed my view a little bit on, on what it takes in the sport, I was just walking in an elevator one time with Riedel and saying, you know, I've seen basketball players with more muscle mass than this guy. And he's such a dominant thrower. And I, I realized form and function. And I started to see these legs that didn't look like even the typical big throwing legs of a discus thrower, much less a shot putter. And I go, you know, that's an amazing uh, event specific look that these guys are getting. Uh, very impressed with Koji Morofushi's father because I met him when I was coaching Bill Green and, and, and that guy was impressive. And it was no sh sh shock to me that the son turned out to be as good as he became is the father had that wiring himself. Mm. And uh, and so you look around and you see these wonderful people. You just get really excited about meeting them. Right. Well, I thank you for sparing some time for us. And I hope we'll get a chance to catch up with you later Anytime. in the season. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you. Take care.